talks for this term. All of them are every Friday at the same time, 4.15, so do come along. Uh, next week, we go marine. We've got uh, Professor Christina Hicks from Lancaster on fishing for nutrition, healthy oceans for people and planet. Uh, the week after, we've got uh, uh, Rewilding Europe. So Sophie Montserrat from Rewilding Europe on Rewilding European Landscapes, Lessons Learned and Future Directions for Science and Practice. Uh, the week after, we have... Uh, James Bullock from CH on rewilding restoration and the future of nature recovery. And the week after we have Laura Martinez-Suz from Q on mycorrhizae and ecosystem functioning. Uh, so, so a nice, nice range of, of topics there. Uh, so do come along to, to all of those. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's, today's speaker, uh, Dustin Benton. Dustin is, uh, works for the Green Alliance, the, the leading environmental think tank in, 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 the, in the UK. Uh, and he's policy director at the Green Alliance, uh, leading work across energy resources and the natural environment, uh, with a particular focus also on, on net zero. Uh, before that, in 2021, he was seconded to DEFRA, where he was chief analytical advisor on the national food strategy. And previously, he's worked on low carbon and, and uh, uh, resource stewardship and other aspects. Uh, uh, before joining Green Alliance, he also worked for the campaign for protect, to protect rural England, where he led on the relationship between landscape protection, climate change, and the new energy infrastructure. So uh, thanks for joining us, Dustin. Justin, over to you. Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, as, as my sort of potted bio will probably give away, uh, I'm not a scientist. Um, my background is more energy systems than land systems stuff. But I actually cut my teeth on uh, not the kind of uh, conservation end of the NGO spectrum, but on the landscape end of the spectrum. So the, the lovely British landscape that you see here, when I first moved to the UK, I, I set about uh, trying to protect, uh, which I think was a good grounding in thinking about how we might need to change the land. Because unlike the energy system with which I'm more familiar, uh, electrons are basically boring to most people. Yeah but land and food is really, really important to people and are really int intimate uh, and cultural and lifestyle and flavor. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a bit of an intro into the work that I have done at Green Alliance and drawing on some of the work that we did in the National Food Strategy. This was the uh, Henry Dimbleby Review, not the government's response, which um, perhaps was less evidence-led than the piece of work that we did. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to try to answer this question for you. Can we have it all from the land system? Um, and the spoiler alert for those of you who, you who want to duck out early is yes, yes, we can, uh, but, uh, and the but is the reason why you should stick around and listen to the rest of what I have to say. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll talk you through kind of the, the big picture stuff on, on how we, how we, how we see things going wrong in the land system, some modeling that we've done about how we might change how we use land. Uh, and then I've got some stuff, uh, depends on how, how long we go for and, and what you guys, whether you, your eyes start to glaze over, I will, I will cut things short. But I've also got some interesting things I hope to say um, on farm incomes. And if we really want to dive into the detail on diet change, which is really hard for somebody who works in a think tank to try to persuade politicians to talk about because diet change is basically the one thing that we cannot talk about politically, uh, certainly in the UK and perhaps not anywhere in the Western world. <clears throat> so what do we want from land? Traditionally, we have wanted basically food from land and, and fuel and fiber, yes, but mostly food. Um, and associated with food production, we have had a lot of cultural value uh, and a lot of the rural economy traditionally. Um, and certainly that's culturally where we think the land system is. We start from the idea of the picture I just showed you that this is a food producing landscape and that food producing landscape pays for a rural economy with the villages and little church spires that make up England uh, and the deep culture that is embedded in Britain. So, you know, England is the country and the country is England, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Recently, we have added some extra stuff that we want from the land, which actually we did always want from the land, but we weren't very explicit about. And that is carbon. So we've got a climate crisis and we now think we want the land system to help remove some of the carbon that we've been busily shoving in there with fossil fuels. 
And we also want lots and lots more habitat for wild species because we've noticed that the natural world is kind of in crisis too. Uh, and uh, it, it's not very nice. So let's let's do something about that. And I, I think the way we think about it is that we want more wild species both on farms and off farms. And I'll come on to that distinction in the rest of my talk. And we've codified that. So um, we've got Montreal Kunming COP15 targets, uh, you know, 30 by 30, which you will have heard of, 30% of land uh, given over to nature by 2030. We also have said that we're going to decrease species extinction ring risk by a factor of 10, which is one of those targets that I don't think the politicians who signed up to it actually understood what they were signing up to, because although I am not a conservation biologist, I, uh, Green Alliance does employ conservation biologists, and they looked at that and, and ran some numbers and went, ooh. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll come on to that as well. Um, and I guess that the simple version of doing all this stuff from the same land system that we used to mostly just get food from, or at least count, is that we need our land to be multifunctional. We need land to do more than one thing. But there are some trade-offs in that multifunctionality. Um, and, uh, you know, really simplistically, one unit of land can't do everything at the same time. So we're going to need to do some specialization. There are some bundles of multifunctionality that fit better with other than other sorts of things. And I'm going to come back to this as a theme of the presentation, because uh, this is one of the most controversial things that I've started to raise in the, in the context of people expert discussion of land systems change. But before I do that, uh, I'm going to go relatively quickly through the kind of context of the land system, give you some of the stats. Uh, if any of you is a student here or a professor, you will probably know this stuff. So please bear with me uh, and please do pick me up on where I've got it wrong uh, when we get to Q&A. So um, let's start with nature. Um, and as an environmentalist, this is a, a really, really depressing graph because it's 50 years of unremitting decline and that's failure. Um, we, we want a natural world that is full of species. What we have is a natural world where kind of no matter what we've tried to do since the 1970s, the, the line goes down. But there's complexity here, obviously. You've got long-term and short-term factors, and some species are doing well, and some species are doing really badly. But in general terms, it's basically like, this sucks. Um, and the big question to me is, how do we turn this around? But against this, we have some government goals. So we've got the domestic goals to halt the decline of nature by 2030, so to make that line at least flatten out, thank goodness, uh, and to increase nature by 10% by 2042. That's the, uh, the goals that the government uh, passed into law last year. And although that would be an extraordinary change, the, the baseline matters a lot. So uh, we, we kind of worked out what, is, what does this actually mean? Because restoring nature is the headline, 10% by 2042 is the policy, but what does it mean in practice? Well, in practice, it means that by 2042, we would restore 1% of the moth, 3% of the butterfly, and 5% of the bird abundance that we've lost since 1970. So that doesn't feel like restoring nature to me, but that's what we've signed up to do domestically. But internationally, the COP15 goals, Montreal Kunming, are radically different. And again, this is sort of first order headline kind of analysis, but decreasing species extinction risk by a factor of 10 in the UK, we think means moving every species in Britain from wherever it is on the threatened to vulnerable thing, all the way across to least concern, so the, the lowest risk, and introducing some locally extinct species. My favorites, just because it's a nice story and I work for a think tank, is the Kentish plover, which, as you will expect, was named for Kent, but no longer lives in Kent. It's a cute, it's a, it's a cute little, you know, sort of fuzzy bird that doesn't bite you, which is the best sort of nature to talk about politically. Um, <clears throat> and if we did that, it would be an absolutely extraordinary uh, change. Uh, so what's what's happened to nature? You know, if if I think about this, because I'm an energy systems guy, I came to this. I don't have a conservation biology background. I was like, okay, what's the root cause? How do I understand this in a kind of engineering mechanistic kind of way? This is like disaster zone. I know for any academics who understand biology and the complexity of the natural world. But I was like, let's be simple. Also, I work for a think tank, so a lot of my job is trying to simplify things so you can make it understandable for politicians who are very clever but have to know loads of things about loads of things and therefore can never get into depth or complexity. So the simple version, this is from the National Food Strategy, the simple version is that this is all of terrestrial vertebrate biomass 11,000 years ago, before the invention of the plow, and this is it today. And what you can see from this graphic is that back in prehistory, there were a lot of wild animals compared to a tiny little speck of people. This is mass, right? This is just weight, basically. And what we have done in the intervening period is 
extraordinary. We have totally transformed the entire, this all terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Sorry, I don't know too much about the seas. That is a massive gap in my, in my analysis. Uh, this work, which has since been superseded, said that uh, today, uh, the mass of farm animals over here is 22 times that of all wild species. Uh, actually, uh, and that half of the weight, or sorry, that the weight of farm animals has tripled between 1961 and 2015. So not only is there a huge change, but also a lot of that change has happened really, really recently. The, the latest science basically says that this, these wild mammals, that bu those bubbles should be half the size that they are. And also for the geeks, uh, we pulled out elephants because that's fun. Actually, the, the graphic design software we used couldn't get small enough. Like there, that, there are not that many elephants by mass. Obviously, they're individually heavy, but it's the, the spec should be much smaller. Uh, sorry. The, the chief analyst in me on the food strategy still lives in there somewhere. I've got to be true to, true to the numbers. <clears throat> so what happened? What, how did we do that? In really simple terms, we massively increased the productivity of the land system. And we did that through selective breeding crops and animals, through the use of synthetic fertilizers, I and mean, the Green Revolution was extraordinary, and we created super abundance, right? So today we grow 6,000 kilocalories per person per day's worth of crops, and we harvest about 4,000 kilocalories per person per day worth of grass and other things that ruminant animals sort of eat. But we turn, so about 10,000 kilocalories available, 6,000 directly consumed by, by people. Obviously, if we ate all of that, we would all be dead of obesity. So we had to get rid of that surplus somehow. And what did we do? Well, we basically turned it into milk, meat, and biofuels. Um, we took all of that abundance. Uh, we lost two thirds of it in what specialists call trophic inefficiency. It's basically that if you grow a cow, you can't eat the whole thing and it takes some energy to grow and be a happy little cow and bimble about the fields and stuff like that. So what you get out is a hundred units of grain or hundred calories of grain go into the front end of a cow. And when you come to eating your steak, you get three calories of grain out the back end. Huge trophic inefficiency. So we've mopped up that fantastic surplus that we've created through the Green Revolution and through harnessing all of Earth's systems to do this. And then we've turned it into a relatively small amount of meat and a whole bunch of biofuels, which are a really stupid thing, but that's an energy systems conversation, which I will come back to later. And I say all of this because you can't look at this graphic and not think about diet, uh, which is a really hard political message. and a, and. A, bluntly a problem. And that's a global story, but I want to bring this back to Britain. <clears throat> so what you see in front of you is a map that is proportionately accurate. Um, it is not, obviously, Wales is not all built up and the Southwest of England is not all peat. When we put this out in the National Food Strategy, I, I threw it onto Twitter and I had loads of people telling me that in fact, Wales was not all built up. Now, I, I am not from Wales, I'm from the United States. I have been to Wales and I noticed that there are some very lovely countryside, uh, but, it is proportionately accurate. And some things come out from looking at this. 72% of the land surface that you see represented there is uh, used to grow food, plus all this area overseas, which is roughly equal in size. And we use all of that land in the UK and overseas just to feed ourselves. And overwhelmingly, that is to grow beef, lamb, and dairy, which if you match the overseas and the domestic is equivalent to the entire land area of Great Britain. Sorry, Northern Ireland, you, you get to grow other stuff, but it's a huge, vast area. But we use only 15% of the land to provide the uh, plants that we eat, but those plants provide two thirds of calories that we eat. So we've got this interesting, you can tell I'm, I'm coming at this from an energy systems, make it simple for stupid kind of perspective, but it's quite helpful in clarifying. If this is how much we, land we use today, and this, prov this land provides two thirds of our food calories. If you want to get more out of your land and that involves using land differently, you're gonna have to change how you use the majority of land, which produces the minority of calories. And that is land that is used ultimately in some way, shape or other for animal agriculture. I'm gonna switch over to carbon because we've got both a nature and a carbon challenge. This is emissions in the UK uh, at the top there in the gray bar. We've done a pretty decent job, not good enough, but Britain's doing pretty well. Uh, this is old data for any of you experts out there. I think it's 2019 data, so apologies, but we've cut overall greenhouse gas emissions by about a third since 2008, pretty good. Let's zoom into the food system. Well, the food system has decarbonized at about half 
the average rate of the economy as the whole, it's lagging. And what you can see from the graphic here is that the stuff on the right hand side there, the kind of complicated bar, that's all the bits of the food system that are like cooking and moving food around and going to the supermarket and all that kind of stuff. That has decarbonized through spillovers from the energy system. So it's more efficient refrigeration, it's renewables in the power system, it's you know more efficient use of gas, that kind of stuff. The blue stuff, which is the food production, the land system related bits haven't changed at all. Nothing has changed since we passed the Climate Act in 2008. Uh, we, we can't carry on that way if we want to get to net zero. Um, and especially we can't carry on that way because the land system is, is kind of unique. Everyone else, basically, every other sector in the economy needs to go to zero but the land system needs to be negative. And that's because if you have net zero, you have residual emissions. So emissions that you can't get to zero or that we assert that you can't get to zero. If you have those positive emissions, you've got to have some negative emissions to offset them. So the net is zero. And if you decompose, this is Committee on Climate Change Analysis, what is, the, what, what is responsible for the residual emissions, the positive emissions in 2050? Actually, the majority of it, nearly 60%, is from the land system itself. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's about 60% land sector emissions, mostly livestock. Uh, then you've got aviation, which is that kind of puce sort of, you know, pinky type color on, on your thing. Looks a bit different on mine. Uh, that's aviation. Um, and then the rest is like really hard to deal with stuff. It's like the residual emissions of methane out of old landfills that are quite difficult to get rid of. It's like little bits of F gas emissions. That's the kind of stuff that you just look at and go, this is really hard, let's, let's maybe just accept we're gonna to have to do some negative emissions. So net zero is the, the net, the negative emissions isn't really for like decarbonizing heavy industry, which is the discourse that I hear a lot, certainly in Westminster. It's actually mostly about, well, I'll be really crude about it. It's a, a societal choice in favor of frequent flyers and frequent burgers fundamentally. So how do we do net negative, right? Here's, here's a kind of schematic. This is the UK's emissions. Again, these, this data is a little bit old, national food strategy stuff. You have three things you can do. You can reduce the amount of emissions that are residual. So that's 60% of residual emissions that are in the land system. You can squish those down by changing farming practices and diets. You can increase the amount of emissions that the land system itself can sequester by growing trees, uh, by restoring peat, doing some soil capture, that kind of stuff. And then you can throw some engineered carbon dioxide removal technologies into the mix, BEX and DAX. The thing to know about BEX, uh, which is biomass with carbon capture and storage mass, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage, is that you need land in order to do BEX because you've got to grow the stuff to feed into the power plant. So really, really simplistically, your plants pull the carbon out of the atmosphere to be plants. You then chuck those plants into a big furnace, stick a cap on the top, you take all the CO2, you shove it into a hole in the ground somewhere over there, and then you are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it uh, geologically. But you need land to do that. So the, in, ultimately, the carbon cycle challenge becomes a land system challenge. So you might be thinking, okay, right, um, we need wildlife and we need carbon storage in our land. Why don't we just add wildlife and carbon storage to our existing farmland, the majority of, of land, and Boom, we solved the climate and, and, uh, and nature crisis. You can tell I'm used to simplifying. I'm getting some laughs here from people who are like, yeah, it's not that simple. It's not. Uh, so let me give you a little bit more complexity here. There are two major biophysical trade-offs that we think you need to reckon with. Experts in the room, please tell me that there are more that I have missed. Uh, the first is um, the trade-off between food yield and biodiversity. So what you see here is on the left-hand side, conventional agriculture, this is an index of bird species, we're taking it as a, an example of, of lots of different wildlife. You can tell me how that's uh, appropriate or inappropriate, but it's really hard to find kind of whole system-wide biodiversity indices that are, are credible and, and granular. This bit in the middle here is low yield agriculture. So you might think of this as a bit like organic or a bit like agroecological or nature friendly farming. There are lots of words here, but it's basically where farmers choose to not maximize the yield on their land in order to make space for nature on their land. And you get way more nature if you do that. But then the third thing is semi-natural habitat. This is land that does not produce food, um, woodland and wetland. And what you see there is a, is a non-linear increase. So semi-natural habitat is very good for species. Um, land that is farmed but managed for nature is much better than conventional agriculture but it's it's sort of you know there, there are trade-offs here between food yield and how much uh, you get in terms of species the second big trade-off is to come back to food and carbon so in simple terms 
If you're producing food on land, you are releasing carbon from land. If you are not producing food, you have the opportunity to sequester carbon. That's true in non-peaty soils and really terrifyingly true in peat soils. Uh, if I was giving this, uh, this lecture at Cambridge, I would talk about the Cambridgeshire Fens, which are some of the most carbon emitting land in Britain, probably the most carbon emitting and terrifying quantities of carbon come out of that land, uh, which we use to, to produce food. Um, so th those are the two big trade-offs. Um, uh, and any, any land system that fits our nature, climate, and food system goals is going to have to reckon with these trade-offs. You can't hide them. You can't fudge them. you just got to kind of bite the bullet on them. Um, so you might all be thinking, hang on a second. You promised that the answer was yes, we can have it all, but you've just spent, what, 20 minutes telling me we can't have it all. Uh, I, I'm a bit depressed. Well, I, I have a few tricks up my sleeve, uh, and we tried to turn those tricks up our sleeve into something that people might be interested in and learn from in a report which we launched at the beginning of the year called Shaping UK Land Use, where we modeled how you could adjust the land system, accounting for these trade-offs to achieve a world in which you had you were meeting your carbon budgets, so all the scenarios that we ran met our carbon budgets. We always tried to meet the nature targets, and these are the domestic nature targets, not the Montreal Kunming ones, those are difficult. Um, they all maintain today's share of food self-sufficiency, so about 60% uh, in the case of the UK, so we're not offshoring our food production in any of them, and they all at least maintain today's farm incomes because we thought it would be unjust if we threw a bunch of farmers off the land and basically said, tough, you don't have a job, you don't have a livelihood, sod rural culture and all that kind of stuff, and some of the scenarios actually improve rural livelihoods. <clears throat> they vary how you use land, what you eat, how much you spend and the balance of where you get your carbon removals from. And they expose some of the trade-offs. So I'm gonna start with um, business as usual. This is what we think happens if we kind of don't do anything. And I'll talk you through this graphic here so hopefully you can under, understand it. It's all an index of today. So more, less percent of present day. So we're saying we're keeping the both the amount of farmlands that we have in the UK today the same, and we're also managing it roughly in the same way. So the underlying model assumes continuous improvement in yields over time, consistent with past history, but we're basically keeping farming broadly on the trajectory it's on. Uh, we're not changing diets, which is that third bar. So we've, we've selected meat and dairy production because it's the most important factor in diets. Obviously other things matter as well. Um, and uh, because that means that your land system is continuing to produce a lot of emissions, we do the kind of simple climate systems bodge of throwing carbon capture and storage, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage at the problem, and we hoover up all the emissions. But of course, we're using all of our land, so we can't get that bioenergy principally from the UK. So we've got to import, and that sort of uh, light uh, sort of yellowy green bar on the overseas land that that is the extra amount of land that we use overseas to do BECs in order to uh, sequester carbon and that is equivalent to about three times the size of, of Wales which I'm reliably informed is the correct unit of measure for these sorts of things. <laughs> the downside is the natural world keeps getting worse. I mean obviously it's taken a bit of a beating so its decline is sort of steady and, and rubbish um, and also I just want to throw out here, we have modeled the cost on this. So take 260 billion quid, obviously what is 260 billion quid? I don't know, but it's relevant to the other numbers you'll see on the next slides. We can definitely do better than this. This is rubbish. So let's do one version of doing better than this. <clears throat> this is where we switch to a nature friendly farming, call it agroecology, call it organic. There are lots of different words here, but basically where we say to farmers, please don't th thrash the land as hard as you can for food yield and build space for nature within the farm system. But don't create wild habitats with no food where we've got farmland, just bring nature in. Now, uh, in order to do that, because that type of farming produces less, we, were, we didn't allow uh, offshoring of food production. So you have to adjust diets. And that's on that middle thing there, you see we have halved meat and dairy consumption. And when you get into the dorky detail of this, what you see is that actually you probably need quite a lot less pork and chicken and eggs, and maybe you get a slightly lower reduction on, on um, ruminant meat, but like think 75% fewer bacon sandwiches in this kind of scenario. Um, because you're changing diet, it's really good. You reduce your overseas land use, so that's a real positive. But because your land system is still producing carbon because of those trade-offs, you have to throw some becks at it, way less. So that, that bar in the, in the second line down says we've got some land overseas for becks, but it's only two times the area of Wales, so we've made a significant improvement. And 
We have met the government's targets for no reduction, no further reduction in species by 2030, which is the uh, bar just above the bottom one. And then in 2050, we have, let me just check, 12% uh, greater species abundance by 2050. So we have arrested the decline of British nature and we are increasing it. It's a real turnaround. And let's be honest, this would be extraordinary. I, I can't, I, don't, I have not found a biologist who, would, who could tell me the last time sort of an index of British species went up, at least in big aggregate, individual species, yes. So this would be a revolution, right? But we can do better than this. Uh, in order to do so, I've got to go back to my trade-offs. So this is the simplistic version of what are the trade-offs. You've got land that is producing really high yields. It's great for producing food. It's not great for nature, and it's not great for climate because it produces carbon. You've got your low intensity farmlands, your agroecological, organic or nature friendly, which is good for food and good for nature, but not good for climate because you're still producing emissions. And then you've got your semi-natural habitats where you've got basically no food production or next to none. You can graze some ruminants in here, but it's not a significant source. And you've got good for nature, good for carbon mitigation. Um, this in essence is uh, what we call, and actually we, we stole this from uh, some conservation scientists, a three compartment model of land use or a three compartment approach. You've got three compartments, you've got your high yield, your low yield, and your semi-natural. And if you do all three of them, you can deal with the trade-offs and get the best, we think, uh, mix of things. So what would happen if we, by 2030, changed current farmland to about 80% of its current extent under conventional about 9% as agroecological or organic or nature-friendly, and about 10% of existing farmland turned into semi-natural habitats. Well, this is what happens according to that same metric before. So you've got your three compartments at the top there. The biggest one is agroecology. So if you're an agroecologist and you want nature-friendly farming, that is the kind of single biggest winner, but you've got a big wadge of semi-natural habitats. So if you love semi-natural habitats, then there's lots of opportunity there. And if you're in favor of conventional agriculture, high yield, we do need to eat. So we think we need some of that, then you've still got some of it. You, in order to balance the system without going for lots of becks, because we didn't want to go for lots of becks for lots of complicated reasons, there is a bit of domestically sourced biomass in this, uh, just to be clear, but we adjusted diets. So we reduced meat and dairy consumption by 45%. We actually took a straight cut. So this doesn't bias against um, pork and chicken. It's just a, a straight cut across the, the different types of meat that we eat. Um, and we think that alternative proteins make this plausible in a way that diet change conversations are not often seen as plausible. And I'll come on to alternative proteins uh, in, in a minute. Uh, the real winner, though, is the natural world, because not only have we arrested the decline in the natural world by 2030, creating semi-natural habitat allows, we think, we model nature to come right back and we get 1.8 times nearly double the amount of nature by 2050 that we have today. That would be an actual serious turnaround. So in thinking about what this looks like, you, you've got a set of landscapes that maximize wildlife habitat and carbon removal. You've got a set of landscapes that are mixing the two sort of classic sharing landscapes in, in the jargon. And you've got some high intensity agriculture. When it comes to um, how humans interact with that, you think about, for example, the Great Fen or, or some lovely woodland, there are people in there full of tourists. You've got some species rich heathland, which has got some rare breed cattle, which at extremely low density are managing that habitat. Uh, you've got wetlands that are full of birds. When it comes to your diet uh, on alternative proteins, uh, because we think that it's implausible to persuade British people to eat 45% less meat just as a dietary health thing, although it would be best for everyone if we just ate a bit less meat, and a little bit more vegetables. My time in the food strategy tells me that more veg, less meat generally is a very good thing to do for your personal health as well as the planet. We have assumed that because Britain tends to eat about 50% of its meat in either processed or pre-prepared forms. So when you go to Tesco and you buy a chicken salad, you're not buying chicken. Tesco has decided how many bits of chicken and what that looks like and probably how it tastes, that that becomes alternative proteins. So this is plant-based or precision fermentation derived or ultimately cell culture meat. Um, and that's, we think the sweet spot or the easy to persuade stuff because it's not like steaks. And that in this world, if you are having a lamb roast or something like that for your Sunday lunch, that comes from a sheep, or if you prefer beef, a cow, which came from the UK, because um, that's how we have done the numbers. So the beef in your burger uh, is probably not beef, 
maybe the lamb in Moussaka isn't, but that uh, Sunday roast remains a uh, farm, an animal farmed in Britain. And the cost is really good of doing this because you're using nature to sequester carbon instead of backs. We think the total cost of doing this is roughly the kind of cost that we already pay every year to support British farmers through what was the common agricultural policy and will become the environmental land management scheme. So hopefully you're like, Dustin, this is great. Let's do it. But you might be thinking, hang on a second, you're showing me bar charts and this is a real country with real people in real places. So where does this all happen? And this is where it starts to get quite controversial. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna dive into the controversy and hopefully you guys can tell me where I've, where I've gone wrong. But my experience of moving from energy systems into land systems is that there's a lot of politeness about what we talk about and few people want to say, actually, we're gonna have to shift this bit of land. And absolutely not true. I, I can't tell you which field parcel shifts to what, that would be inappropriate. I work in Westminster, don't listen to me, listen to the, the person who actually manages the land. But the data, the analysis, the economics, the kind of conservation scientists does tell you something in big picture. And it's helpful to think through what that might mean at national level. So hopefully I've laid on the caveats thick enough that the, uh, the arrows or rotten tomatoes aren't gonna come straight at me. This is a little bit of orientation. Um, so when I came into the food strategy, one of the big questions was, is there a conflict between saving nature and stopping climate change? Can we use land to do the same thing? Hopefully, analytically, you've, you've uh, bought my analysis on three compartments um, already, but I wanted to throw in the spatial component to this. So what you see here is essentially an optimization model where red is protect me now and gray is I'm not that important. That's a really crude bastardization, but to help you time-wise, hopefully that's useful. This is what you do, where you protect if you're optimizing for carbon storage. You want to stick as much carbon in the landscape as possible based on existing land uses. So this is not like growing new woodland. This is what happens if you're like, I want to protect the UK Biodiversity Action Plan species and I am optimizing where I protect first. So darkest red is first, gray is wait for a while. And this in the middle is what if I want to do both at the same time? And the really, really optimistic thing about this analysis says that 90% of the things that you want to do just for biodiversity line up with the things that you want to do just for carbon. So there's a really good connection between these two things. Simplistically, it says, you can do both things at the same time on the same land. And those are the places to pay attention to. So I'm just gonna remove some of the complexity and give you just the both carbon and nature at the same time map. And I want you to pay attention to places like, sorry, it's a bit sort of squished over here, like this bit of England by, by sort of Pool Harbor kind of way. Uh, ignore the fens for a moment. I'll come back to that. They're really hard. Uh, you can see the English uplands come out there and Unfortunately, this is where devolution creates some analytical problems for me because the next stuff I'm going to show you is England only data. Obviously, it's a whole country and I'm only showing GB. So sorry again, Northern Ireland. Uh, data for Northern Ireland is quite difficult. Um, and so you're, what you're going to see is, is slightly England biased. <clears throat> so I've given you we can protect carbon in nature in the same spaces. There's good correlation between those two. But what about food? We've got to grow food. We need food from the land system. Well, what you're seeing here, the light blue overlay, is the area of land that grows a third of the food that's grown in England and roughly 28% of the land, uh, of all the food that's grown in the entirety of the UK. And most of the difference is in the grey bits of Aberdeenshire, Angus and Fife up there in Scotland. Um, so first order approximation, again, this is top down, does not tell you what you do at field level you probably want to keep the blue bits as high yielding agriculture because they produce lots of food for a relatively small land area. So let's expand it out. This, these two washes, so you can see the, you can see the kind of dark blue and then this kind of lighter blue, that's three quarters of all the food on a calories basis that we grow in England. Um, so there's, I'm just checking sure I've got it. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that begins to come out here. What you see is that the places that you want to protect most, you can still see the red bits still show up on the map. I've only covered a little bit of the red. Ignore the fans, ignore the fans. They're really hard. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> but as I, as I kind of just toggle through these things, what you're seeing is actually, huh, maybe we could really prioritize the protection of those dark red areas, again, England only data, without losing much food production. and 
in the food strategy, we found that the 20% lowest yield, yielding land, which is statistically most likely to be in the blank spaces on this map, uh, produces less than 3% of what we grow in the UK, which because we're importers is about 1% of what we eat. The advantage of this is you can change quite a lot of land without having to even ask the question, should we change what we eat? Because it's producing such a small fraction of the food that we actually consume. We're going to have to deal with diet, but politically it's quite useful to say there are places where we can make tangible change for nature and for carbon without having to do that first. And just to prove that, we worked out where would you put forestry if you were trying to do the, the Committee on Climate Change's Balanced Net Zero Pathway, which involves growing a lot of forestry. You can do that either through um, planting or natural regeneration. We constrained this to broadleaf woodland because our principle was do things that are good for both climate and nature. We're going to need some conifers because we also need wood for lots of other things, but that's a complexity we can get into in the questions. And so what you see here is within the lowest 14% uh, of food producing land, so basically not much food is produced. Uh, sorry, let me just double check I've got my numbers right. Yes, within that 14%, you need 17% of that 14%, so on the order of 2% of land. And what this shows you is a kind of field level analysis of which fields would be climatically and economically suitable to turn over to forestry. Top down modeling, right? Like the people who own and manage the land are definitely going to know better than my funny little map, but it gives you a sense of where you might go with this stuff. And that's interesting. And just while we're on spatial stuff, and I should say, sorry, before, before I go on, this could be big contiguous forest if that's what you want, but it doesn't have to be. If your landscape preference is little pepper potted bits of copses and all that kind of stuff, you can have that. There's, there's an interesting conversation to be had both about what people's landscape preferences are and what the conservation kind of goal might look like. I, I have been very mean, particularly in Scotland, by, by not having data about it, but we did run some numbers about where government is actually going. And there's an interesting thing that's going on because the government really doesn't like spatial stuff. It took me quite a lot of time to persuade uh, when I worked for DEFRA uh, us to publish some of this analysis, which is deeply spatial, because quite rightly, politicians go, well, I'm not going to tell uh, farmer Jill down the road how she should use her land. That's totally inappropriate. She knows way better than me, and it would be totally inappropriate to do so. But you've got to make some decisions. And so what we found when we looked at the carbon numbers is actually, at the moment, it looks like perhaps accidentally, England is expecting Scotland to do an awful lot of afforestation. And I feel like we might want a democratic conversation about that across the four nations in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so I've tried to talk about a bit, bit about people, but I haven't really told you very much about people and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be relatively swift on the people end of things. People manage the land, people make their livelihoods out of the land. They are really important. They are real human beings and top down doing things to them ain't gonna work. But I want to give you a baseline on how the economics of farmland works in the UK, because when I came at this, I was really shocked. And everyone I speak to in my sort of friend and family circles who are now dead bored with me about all things uh, land, nature and food are like, oh, this is interesting. <clears throat> so this shows you farm income uh, on the positive side. You've got uh, stuff that makes money on the negative side. You've got stuff that loses money. The um, Black lines are the profit from the net profit from the enterprise if you don't pay for labor. Uh, and because most farmers are sole traders, they don't pay themselves for labor. They just take the profit from the business. The orange line is what you do if you pay the price that you would have to pay if there was no farm owner and they just used employees. What this shows you, because the orange line is below zero, these are businesses that are losing money. And in normal terms, they would not exist because they would have gone bankrupt, with the exception of large arable farms, which are profitable. But only 25% of farms across the country actually make a profit from growing food, which is the gray bar here. Um, almost, I mean, the vast majority, 75%, either make a profit from subsidy, which is the two green bars, uh, or diversification, which is like the farm shop that sells ice creams, which is a great thing hooray for farm shops, but not traditionally seen as like the core business of farming. And that's really important to understand because we have a land system which we're subsidizing, like we as society not explicitly are choosing to use it in particular ways. And this isn't actually very good for the people because if you look at these farm incomes, they suck. Like they're, they're poor incomes. And if you monetize the sort of real value of particularly upland farmers' times, it would be illegal to employ them because they're working for below the minimum wage. 
I don't think that's just, and I don't think we should carry on doing that. Uh, and so when we think about how we change things, we ought to take account of that social factor as well. So we ran a little thought experiment. What if we monetized the value of nature and carbon at 75 pounds per ton of CO2? And we picked that number because up until recently, it was the UK's uh, ETS price. So this is a real measure of what we're actually paying for carbon in some bits of the economy. Um, and what we did was to say, we're going to pay for carbon. We don't know how much nature is worth. So we're going to restrict our carbon removal or carbon reducing techniques to things that we know are good for nature, even though we can't monetize it. So it's basically broadly for the compete restoration. This is what happens if you change the subsidy basis to that for small upland grazing farms and lowland grazing farms. So these are the farms that are doing worst economically out of today's system. The four things are area of land on the individual farm. So this is don't do anything to the farm. This has changed the whole farm. This has changed two thirds. That's changed one third. Because this is not a decision that we can impose from Whitehall, Westminster, Oxford, whatever. This is a decision that individual farmers will need to make for themselves. But if you pay for woodland creation, then a farmer can match their current income in the uplands if they afford a third of their farm and get paid for the carbon benefits. And again, we're planting broadleaf woodland with the assumption that we're not cutting it down for the timber value. And they can do really well if they go the whole hog, but there's a choice for them. If you want to run sheep on the land, even though sheep are loss making, you can do half, or you can do a two thirds of the farm of sheep. You can do one third of the farm of sheep. That's a choice which we should make available to farmers and land managers. It's way more lucrative with peat because peat is just such a disaster for the climate. So all the numbers basically say, do, do peat restoration about as fast as you can. But you might be worried, well, hang on a second. What about food security? If we're, at, if we're paying farmers to grow trees and not food, aren't we gonna starve or offshore? Well, not necessarily. So we looked at the most, uh, the wealthiest farmers, the, the farmers who are large arable farmers, general cropping farms in, in this case. <clears throat> what if you paid them 75 pounds a ton? Would they stop producing food and instead grow trees? And the answer is no. So if you remove the subsidy from large arable farmers, they do less well than they do right now because those farms make around 100,000 pounds from selling food. And then we as society give them about an extra 115,000 pounds in subsidy because they're, they're managing the land. Interesting question about whether we want to continue to do that in the future. For this modeling exercise, we've decided we don't. If you pay them for carbon, they could go the whole hog and just plant a woodland on their farm, but they don't make any more money by not doing that. So our argument is this doesn't change the incentives for food production on the most food producing land, which is probably an advantage. I'm nearly out of time. So I'm just gonna to touch very, very briefly on what do we think policy needs to do in order to bring about some of the lovely, wonderful world that I've just described, which of course you all agree with. Uh, and the simple version is that we need a land use framework, which some of the government has committed to producing, and uh, as far as I'm aware, will produce uh, probably next month, uh, which is spatially explicit. Interesting question about whether it will be. Enables this multifunctional by default approach, but reckons with the trade off. So you can have a multifunctional woodland, which is brilliant for access, for water quality, for species restoration, for carbon removal, and for recreation, but probably doesn't grow very much food. You can have a shared landscape, which is producing great quality beef, lamb, dairy, all that kind of stuff, has got way more nature on it, is producing food, but probably isn't storing much carbon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's got to be explicit about those trade offs. We need an environmental land management scheme, the subsidy regime that follows that logic of the, of the land use framework, which enables farmers, gives them the choice to say, you can have a better income if you do some of these things that society wants, carbon, nature, et cetera. Uh, but ultimately this must be a decision for the farmer and land manager. We're not in a kind of top-down land reform sort of world, not one that I would advocate. We need to move really fast. If you want to get to where I said we could get to nearly doubled nature, no imports for backs, half the UK's overseas land footprint as food secure as today, then you need to change 2.5% of farmland every year from high intensity farmland to either lower yielding agroecological farmland or semi-natural habitat. It's really quick. And we need to have a conversation about what really quick means in the context of a land system that has stayed very sane for a very long time. We probably need a lot of alternative proteins, and that's because my judgment is, based on lots and lots of deliberative dialogues that I took part in in the National Food Strategy, is that people are up for diet change, but sausages are really tasty. Uh, and so if we can make sausages that 
taste like sausages, but don't involve the land use, the pollution, et cetera, of growing a pig, then my God, that makes the, the, uh, the change much more, uh, much easier. And finally, we need to work out how to imbue pride in the activity, not just of growing food, but of managing land. One of the biggest barriers to land use change is the idea that your value as a, as a vocation, and particularly upland farmers, they're not doing it for the money, they're doing it because they are doing good for the world and, and reinforcing a set of culture and rural community, which is really, really valuable. We need to translate some of that pride associated with growing the biggest lamb into having the biggest bird population and the most beautiful landscape for people to live, work, recreate in. And that pride transition is probably the most politically tricky thing, but the most essential. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Fantastic you range of analyses. We'll open up the questions. But I'll kick off with one. Uh, mm. uh, toward the latter half of your presentation, uh, you sort of took because the, the carbon has a proxy for biodiversity yes. value. But earlier on in your the Thomas paper, you show that the biodiversity hotspots were largely in southern Britain. Uh, the biodiversity, the carbon fiber hotspots were in the, in the uplands. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and the biodiversity priorities, a lot of them are, are agricultural, you know, food producing areas, major food producing areas. So, how does taking that map into account change or well, change your analysis? So, uh, if you think about biodiversity as a priority rather than carbon. Well, so I had this, I gave a version of this talk to Nature Scott, which is the uh, the kind of nature protection agency in Scotland. And they grumbled at me when I showed them this slide. because so they were like, hang on a second, you are undervaluing Scottish wildlife. I am, I am not enough of a conservation biologist to take a view. All I would say, well, I have an interesting, I'm, I'm interested in your view. Um, <clears throat> this is by UK Biodiversity Actions Plan Species, right? So someone has decided these are the species that we care about. I don't know whether in deciding these are the species that we care about, which probably don't include very many slugs, um, that we haven't accidentally biased toward the species that are in and around the Golden Triangle and the South of England. There, there's a really open question, which I never got to the bottom to when I was doing the National Food Strategy, about which nature do we want to conserve? Mm -hmm. Because that question is really important to then what type of habitat do you create and where? So I've hidden it, but it's mm -hmm. a really important question. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. We can discuss later. Maybe <laughs> open up to this. Hello, uh, I'm Sue Roberts, and I um, run a community interest company called Bioabundance. What we were concerned about was overdevelopment, the massive house building programs that all governments or all, all political parties seem to desire, which we believe is way beyond what is actually needed and is being driven by. Uh, capitalism rather than by need um, and how does that all square because that is not one of the things that you've got as one of your needs and my other question is can we have these fantastic slides and can we have a little potted version of you just speaking it all the time because <laughs> <laughs> so amazing oh it is oh fantastic that's great you can, yeah, you yeah. can uh, yeah. cut and mash me up as, as you see fit <laughs> uh, I look forward to the deep fakes um, <clears throat> on the on the question of other land uses, uh, it's a good question, and I think in a way, we this is where my my time back at the Campus of Protectoral England starts to become useful because the kind of analytical I'll tell you the analytical story, but then I'll I'll tell you the like, but I'm not a spreadsheet and you're not a spreadsheet, and that's not how we think. So analytically, if I want to do all the onshore wind, just as one technology, and I'll come onto housing in a second, that we need by 2050, according to the CCC, I need about um, one percent of land. If I want to do all the solar and I want to do it all ground mount, so I'm banning solar on rooftops for fun, I need 1% of England. If I want to build all the housing I need for an 80 million population in 2080, I need 1.8% of land. Total so, including what we've got? Additional. Oh. These are all additional. Uh, so we're about 9, 10, 11, depends on how you count, percent built, built up in uh, the UK. So the stats basically say it doesn't matter, but that's not real life. Like I don't interact with land and landscape in Britain as this is not a country that's got lots of towns and built up development and roads and all that kind of stuff. I see them everywhere. You know, I, I'm from the West Coast of the United States. So my kind of set point is quite a lot of space. And by comparison, England is a beautiful and rich and diverse country, but it's got lots of people. And it's got lots of stuff in it. Right. 
So in a way, this is where, to me, the story is one of how do we plan for this infrastructure in a way that is sensitive, thoughtful, in keeping with the landscape, in keeping with what people want. But it's a different question from the kind of large scale land use change that we probably need to see in rural landscapes uh, for nature and biodiversity reasons. They're different logics. They, they need, they're both really important, but they, the way you come at them is, is a different governance mechanism and a different way of thinking. Hi, Dustin. Thanks very much for the uh, really nice presentation. Um, I just wondered uh, on your in your optimistic slide, um, the nice bar charts. I just was curious about um, how the vision works for land based workers. Like, as obviously you get these massive farms with like one or two people managing five hundred acres. Just wondering how that projects to the number of people having access to working the land. So there's a choice, right? Like if you're, the, where I'm going to is the, is the, um, the upland currently economically marginal farm that makes a, an individual land use change choice to either go for peat restoration or woodland creation. As a farmer or a land manager, you've got a choice. You can take this money and you can not turn that into jobs and uh, you can just, you know, extract more profit in exchange for a valuable service for society. Or you can think, maybe I can employ some people as a business. Maybe I can do some diversification stuff. Um, I mean, the, the woodland management question, the peatland management question, there really depends on who you talk to. There's a kind of rewilder to um, nature conservation as an intensive management uh, kind of spectrum. And I, I sort of don't have a view on that, at least certainly not in this context. But if you take the view that what we want is lots of management of nature for nature's sake, what I'm saying is that it is pretty easy to justify enough money to employ people to do that and to do so in a way that in theory anyway I could build quite a credible treasury business case for doing. I'd like to encourage people online to ask questions as well in the, the, the chat uh, uh, and so Alison has just put, Alison Smith just spoke to one which we have to ask so now can we ask about the fence so if we do the right time <laughs> <laughs> okay my, my, my signaling worked and didn't work <laughs> So the fens are a nightmare, right? Because they are pretty significant for food production. Uh, I'll just get my, uh, so you can see they're, they're in that dark blob and uh, quite a lot of the most emitting and nature valuable bits of the fens are in that high intensity food production region, but we can't afford to use the fens that way. So I don't have a full answer for you, but I've got partial answers. Partial answer one is, uh, I, I haven't shown the, the analysis, but we did some analysis for seasonal rewetting of peatland whilst keeping it under agricultural management. So you're still growing crops. You switch from winter wheat to, for example, to spring sown wheat. So you take about a 30% yield penalty by, by doing that, but you keep the water table high in the winter so that your peat sort of stops degrading or stops degrading very substantially. And that, is like a halfway house answer between create a lovely new Fenland wetland and continue producing for food. So that's answer one. Answer two is actually the yield penalty of moving that intensively cropped land out of the fens and to somewhere else, which is good, but not quite as good is only five to 10%. So you take a bit of a yield hit and obviously you've got to use land somewhere else, right? So somewhere else is getting, getting the high kind of high intensity agriculture. But you could move to quite a bit of Lincolnshire if you wanted to. I'm not saying this is what we should do. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying theoretically, a 10, 5 to 10% yield hit is not that great in exchange for beautiful new wetlands that have stopped emitting carbon and maybe, maybe, maybe in some time might start to sequester something. So there are some options that we have, but let's not pretend that this isn't difficult. Whatever we do, we're going to need a lot more water in the fens, whether we continue agriculture or whether we choose to rewild. Hi, <clears throat> I'm curious about whether food prices has figured into your modeling at all. So the, the short answer is no. Um, what we've seen at the farm level is that last year was a really good year. Um, so farmers 
at the moment, government is reducing the amount of basic payment subsidy, the unconditional subsidy that we give in function of, of amount of land managed. Um, and it's it will be a third less, I think, by the end of this year than it was uh, at the point at which we, we formally left the EU. Um, but food prices, good year for farmers last year because food prices went up and they got some of that benefit. They didn't get all of it, to be clear. A lot of the money went elsewhere in the food system. But that has kind of masked the economic change. Um, so I would expect this year things to feel quite a lot different in uh, farming communities as subsidy levels are falling. The options which I've described for you, payments for nature and carbon, aren't available. They should be, but they're they're pretty hard to come by at the moment. So we're going to see some, some challenges there. At the level of retail food prices, what we know is that um, agroecological food production, with the exception of meat and dairy, it can be produced at farm level at the same per unit cost. So if we're making courgettes, let's just say, I can grow your courgettes in an agroecological manner, not with organic certification, because that adds costs, for a similar sort of price for conventional horticulture. But what I lose is yield, so I produce fewer of them. So at a price level, it ought not change, but if you want the same number of courgettes, then you need either more land under courgettes or you're gonna to have to accept that you eat fewer courgettes. That's the kind of simple version on, on the price thing. If you want organic, agroecological, high nature value meat, then you're gonna to have to pay more. And the principal reason is that um, because animals need a lot of grain, if you're using an organic or an agroecological grain, that yield loss makes a big difference. The cows don't eat less food. Actually, they eat more food because they live longer. That's one thing that agroecologists, um, organic people like is, you know, you basically conventional agriculture, the, 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 the MO is uh, fatten them up quick and kill them young because that's the way you make cost effect. I mean, we've done amazing things to chickens to make them really fat, really young, and we kill them very quickly. I'm not passing comment on the animal welfare questions that this obviously raises, but it's very efficient in an amoral kind of way. If you take a view that that's not what you want to do, then you're gonna to have to put more grain and you're gonna to have to have fewer chickens per year. And that means the prices are gonna go up. We've kind of left that out of the analysis. On the other side, alternative proteins, if you do a kind of bottom up engineering type analysis, they ought to be really, really cheap. And so if you're switching your processed chicken that goes into your chicken dippers or whatever for uh, some form of alternative protein, probably that bit of your food basket gets much cheaper. So maybe you can buy the organic chicken for once a week and your chicken dippers or whatever aren't actually made of chicken and they're cheaper. So what about food waste? Oh, first of all, that was an amazing talk. Thank you. And I have in-laws who live in Scotland and farm and I think you've hit the nail on the head. And I'm not gonna say some things in case they watch this, uh, <laughs> but thank you for that. Um, what about food waste? Uh, yeah, food waste is really, really um, important. I, ooh. since you've asked, I'm going to go through the dorky detail slides, forgive me. Um, this is the slides for geeks bit. Um, yeah, food waste is probably a third of, uh, of where we do food losses. So what you're seeing here is a whole bunch of kind of like, how do we go from field through several steps to stomach? And you can see there are losses all along the way. So look at the top left hand side. Sorry, this is really dorky slides and they're quite small. But uh, you can see the kind of edible grown crops, about 6,000 calories, grass and stuff, about 4,000 calories and how we go down. A big loss is that animal conversion losses. But what you see is nibbling away at each level is food loss and waste at each level in the chain. So if we can get rid of that, there is a big dividend. However, it's quite difficult to get rid of that. What we, When we look at food waste, what we see is that countries that have expensive food, where they have the technology to preserve it, and this is important, they, they waste less food. Where countries have cheap food, like in the United States, where I'm from, we waste a lot of food because it's cheap. And it's very difficult to incentivize people to take lots of care about something that, you know, it's just, it's pennies, who, who cares? So, there's a bit of a problem with the food waste story, which is that if you want low, low food waste, I'm happy to make food expensive, but I don't want expensive food. So do I have to accept food waste? I hope that's roughly the answer. Um, just a really small question. When you were talking about uh, the profitability of farms, you compared uh, small farms to large farms. What are the definitions there? 
It's a good question, but quite a complicated one. Uh, it doesn't, like, I assumed it was hectares or something obvious like that. Actually, it's a really complicated um, metric about the theoretical amount of labor that you would need in order to run the farm. The methodology is really, really complicated. It's like buried deep in Defrostat's land. Um, but it's actually not a terrible proxy for big and small. It's just not actual physical size. It's number of people that you would theoretically need to employ if you were to staff it in the theoretical way that you should. And do you have a rough estimate of what proportion of UK farms are big versus small? Most are small farms. So disproportionately in terms of number of farmers, I don't know the stats correctly offhand, but the vast majority of small farms, there are a relatively small number of large farms, <clears throat> and they are disproportionately likely to be both profitable and producing a large fraction of the total food that we produce. This is another question. Uh, uh, so much of your analysis points towards dietary shifts yeah. an essential part of that. How feasible are scenarios for a significant dietary shift to other level requires? <laughs> This is a people problem fundamentally, right? Like we know, uh, I'll, I'll take, so we've got lots of different types of diets all across the world and lots of different types of diets that are very, very tasty. Uh, take the Indian subcontinent, for example, brilliant food culture, very low meat consumption, quite a bit of dairy, but broadly sustainable. You can have every lovely flavor you can possibly imagine just on the Indian subcontinent. So there's no reason. I mean, we've got lived like 1.3 billion people's worth of lived proof that we can do this, right? But we've also got what, like 6 billion people's proof or 5.5 billion people's proof that we're not doing that. And every trend line that I see is that everyone everywhere in the world is eating more meat. That in a sense is why I have to be optimistic about alternative proteins. But the reason why I am also optimistic about alternative proteins is because when I look at the kind of science that's going on in the alternative protein space, what I see is something that looks a bit like the renewable sector. Lots of technology bets that are being made, lots of innovation, which is taking from stuff that we already need, already know how to do in, in adjacent kind of technologies. And it looks to me like that is likely to be a goer. And if that becomes a goer, if alternative proteins become the same or similar enough taste and cheaper than all of the diet change stuff we know from Britain is that people switch really, really rapidly. Um, at the moment, we are not investing enough and we are not uh, thinking in policy terms about how to do that. But um, I think that will probably shape our diets uh, quite substantially in the future. But of course, I should say the best thing for you is to eat more plants and less meat. Not necessarily none. That's a personal choice. That's brilliant. But we do not eat enough plants in Britain. I think on average, we eat just over two out of our five a day, which is really poor. And I also eat far too much cake. This is not a kind of I'm perfect uh, telling you what to do. We all do it. Would you seem to be holding not much hope for behavioral shifts? Is it a generational turn is going to take that does? I, I live in London and I want to believe that my London mates who are, you know, kind of on the veggie vegan spectrum or at least low meat kind of people are representative, but they really are not. Like the stats say we are eating ever so slightly less meat, but nothing like the trajectories that I've described in my scenarios. I can account for a world in which we continue to eat a lot of meat and I can brute force my model into giving you net zero and I can even get some nature conservation out of it, but you won't like what I have to do to animals. We, we ran this scenario in the food strategy, a kind of ultra intensification scenario. So tower blocks with cows and pigs in it. And people were like, ick, that is not in keeping with British values. Don't do it. And we said, well, would you accept diet change? And they were like, well, OK, actually, maybe, maybe, yeah, because we don't like the kind of pigs and tower blocks thing. So there's a conversation to be had, but it's a really hard conversation. And there are lots of traps that you fall into in having it. And also you have to structure the conversation well. When we had our kind of democratic dialogues in the food strategy, when you start with meat reduction, immediately people are like, right, I'm a pure carnivore. I'm not eating anything other than meat. And somebody else is like, I'm only eating vegetables and that's it. And then they, they're like, fight, fight, fight. And you're like, okay guys, chill. <laughs> Let's just be a bit cool. And over time, if you enter into a conversation, people are like, yeah, okay, that's a bit silly, actually. There's a, there's a kind of reasonableness. But that instantaneous polarization, when, you, when politicians see that and they go, I am not touching that, or I'm not touching that, that unless the polarization really helps me out. And thank goodness in Britain, we have decided so far that that polarization doesn't yet help politicians out. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, thanks for the great talk. I'll be digesting it over the next few days and okay. thinking back on it. Um, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering about urbanization. Uh, if you move someone from a rural place to the city, does this improve situations or does it make it worse? And does this vary under your different scenarios? Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, we, we didn't look at the difference between consumption patterns across rural and urban people. Uh, what I can say is that in a country like the UK, there are not very many rural people in aggregate. Uh, about 13%, 13 to 60% of the population, depending on how, how you count, counts as, as rural. So whether or not that is good or bad, I don't know. But um, the, the, we are an urban country in terms of where people actually live. Sorry to not have the answer. Um, no. no, no, no. Ask your ask your question. We'll we'll pass the mic around. We might collect a few, or you you don't want to ask a question. Well, um, my my question was about the alternative proteins. Go for it. Uh, my my understanding was that chicken fingers and hamburgers and sausages are made from waste products from meat. So, for replacing those with alternative proteins, what are we going to do with the meat waste products? Very occasionally, they are made from waste products. But if you speak to farmers, and if you speak to somebody, an organization like the AHDB, which is the kind of levy funded body that promotes the, the British um, livestock and, and arable farming industry, they will tell you how they lament the fact that over the last 20 or 30 years, we've stuck more and more of the cow into the mincer. Uh, and the reason why they don't like it is because when you take a cow and you turn it into mince, you've just taken quite an expensive thing and turned it into quite a cheap thing. Like all things being equal, you want to sell as much of the cow as steak and whole cuts as you possibly can, because that's where the value is. But people want cheap food. And so we stick it in the mincer. So there's this interesting kind of thing as to the like, would you end up in a situation where you raised meat food waste by creating alternative proteins? In, in the extremis, you might, but I think if you if you ran the experiment in real life, what you'd find is that um, some types of meat got more expensive. Probably meat producers would be incentivized to produce more of their animal as whole cuts. Uh, so you might, at the, in the edge cases, have some issues. But I think that if you did that, the overall amount of environmental benefit and health benefit would be so large as to, as to overwhelm those things. Also, if you create that kind of problem, then people are like, ooh, what could we do with this interesting kind of waste opportunity? And, you know, essentially peasant cuisine in any meat eating country in the world tells you how you use the little random bits of meat in very flavorful ways. So I'm pretty confident in humanity's innovation ability there. Thanks for a great talk, Dustin. I just wanted to um, probe on your analogy between uh, alternative proteins and, and um, renewables. Um, renewables generally associated with decentralization and democratization of the energy system. Uh, aren't alternative proteins associated with centralization and industrialization of, of, of the food sector? <clears throat> the, uh, the smart aleck response is offshore wind. Um, but uh, let me take seriously your question. Uh, I think there are several plausible futures for alternative proteins. So let's just take precision fermentation, which I'm of the three families of alternative proteins, I think is probably the one that is likely to be most interesting over the next decade. Um, <clears throat> it's essentially brewing. It's like very sophisticated brewing. And what we know from the alcohol industry is you have your Anheuser-Busch or your Heineken's, which are cost optimizing kind of super businesses that taste, you know, I like their beer. Um, but basically the economic incentives are like make one big vat in Denmark and sell it to the world because that's the cheap model. And I suspect that that will be true for some types of precision fermentation where the returns to scale are so great, you just centralize. But we also have microbreweries and the end user cost is a bit more expensive, but people buy it because they like it. And I drink microbrewed beer. So I think there is the opportunity for a diversity within the system. If we get the policy right, like we're gonna have to be really strict on the IP because I could very easily see that the IP gets locked up and that turns it into just big business. Uh, you also are gonna need quite a different skill set. So my favorite 
alternative protein upland sheep farmer. There's a guy named Ilta Dunsford, who I think is 3F bio. He's a, he's a biochemist by training and also a sheep farmer in Wales. And he, he's like, I think I'm going to have my sheep farm and I'm going to have a bit more wilderness on it, but I'm going to still grow sheep and I'm going to have my bioreactors in the shed and I'm going to do a combination of both of them. And it would be really cool if we had more of him. <laughs> You, you mentioned the environmental land management scheme and how you would like it to pay out for things. Uh, surely they are framing elms by now <laughs> um, and therefore will your version be able to feed into it? Or does that come along later? It's a good and open question. Uh, the bones of the environmental land management scheme are good. Uh, so there are three schemes within it. There's the sustainable farming incentive, the countryside stewardship scheme, which used to be called local nature recovery and landscape recovery. And I think if you take the original vision of ELM in the 2000, 2018 white paper that Michael Gove ever saw, you can see within that a route to, you know, support for lots of farmers, support for diversity, support for organic agroecological type production, support for some more semi-natural habitats and a good spectrum between those sorts of things. In practice, the system doesn't seem to be moving in that direction just at the moment, um, but I guess I would say it's all to play for. I'll just take that up with a Channeling 101 online. Political mm -hmm. Where do you feel we are in terms of political will to deliver both, both for the current government or effectively a different government in a year's time? Let me discuss this. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a professional environmentalist, which means I'm duty bound to be an optimist. Um, but let me just be a little bit more analytical for a moment. Um, this government has put quite a lot of its credibility on the line to do things like to pass a, you know, a set of laws that protect nature. They didn't have to do that. Uh, when I when I see what Therese Coffey has done, she has I think mean, she got the laws over the line, even though they were kind of stalling. She and the British government was really important in the Montreal Kunming COP. Like I think that British diplomacy was really very helpful in getting that agreement over the line. So this government isn't. I don't think it has a, a kind of negative record. What it will get done in the next year is an interesting and open question. Obviously, we're heading towards an election, an election that's one of the most contested for quite a long time. Um, and naturally, any political person will be seeking to win more than necessarily seeking to govern at the moment. So that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. As to what happens after the next election, well, uh, again, part of my job is to goad, support, finagle, uh, sort of draw all political parties into making really big promises grounded in data on how they're going to restore nature and save the climate. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you want to read more on your website? Uh, yeah, Green Alliance, uh, just Google us. Uh, and uh, we've got loads, much of the research that I've showed you today is up on there. The farm income slides will probably be out at the end of next week. So um, there's loads of lovely stuff. Thank you very much for coming. And we have drinks just down the corridor. So feel free to join. And We're in the diversity room. room so. In the diversity room, so down the ground floor. Come and have a drink with us and probably. Hopefully, you know, not not too many uh, it's minds that I that I've had some very conceptual things. It was, it was really nice to have a system sort of okay. data database to talk as well. It's good. Okay. And I, I hope I haven't got my conservation biology wrong. <laughs> <laughs>